I'm Nathan Rutherford, and welcome to Myth Madness. Over the last three episodes, I've covered the myths of the Greek hero Heracles. I've talked about his parents, his youth, and his famous twelve labors. But this isn't the end of Heracles' heroic career. He went on plenty of other adventures afterwards. The event that triggered the labors was when Heracles went insane, sometimes according to the will of the goddess Hera, and killed his newly formed family. The labors were the way he was to gain forgiveness in the eyes of gods and men. In all cases, Heracles kills his children with only the number of children changing in the different sources. In most cases, Heracles kills his young wife, Megara, as well. In the versions where Megara is not killed, Heracles gave his wife to his nephew, Iolaus, to marry. Fast forward through the twelve labors, and with his tasks now complete and without a wife, either because he killed or gave her away, Heracles now desires a new one. It's here where Heracles' after-labor troubles begin. The young woman he was attracted to was Ioli, the daughter of King Eurytos of Ocalia. Eurytos had previously said he would marry his daughter to whoever won an archery contest. Heracles entered the contest, and of course won. Eurytos was not pleased. He had actually already met Heracles. Eurytos was Heracles' childhood archery teacher. Unlike a lot of Greek myth father figures, he is very protective of his daughter, even though he was perfectly willing to send her off with whichever ne'er-do-well could shoot an arrow the best. But Heracles is too ne'er-do-well for Eurytos. He fears Heracles' infamous anger, the anger that killed one of his other teachers, Linus. If Eurytos sends Aeoli off with Heracles, how will he know she is safe? How will he stop a repeat of what happened with Megara? Eurytos was right to be afraid, as Heracles could be very violent and unpredictable. He declared Aeoli would not be married to Heracles, and he told Heracles to leave Ocalia. This time, Heracles did leave. Later, though, he met Eurytos' son in Tyrans. Probably following some exchange of insults, Heracles threw the young man off the city walls and killed him. Once again, Heracles' rage got him into trouble. And once again, Heracles sought purification for a murder. First, he went to Nellius, king of Pelos, but Nellius refused to carry out the rituals. Heracles was forced to leave. Next, he went to Hippocoon, a king of Sparta, who also refused. Finally, Heracles went to the Oracle of Delphi for guidance, probably because he had headed there before when he needed purification so many years ago. This time, though, the Oracle was silent. The third time wasn't the charm for Heracles, and he was really angry now. Heracles grabbed the Oracle's tripod and threatened to take it away and set up his own rival Oracle. The god Apollo appeared and moved in to grab the tripod back from the human. What follows is a tripod tug of war between Heracles and Apollo, which became a popular scene in Greek art. There was no victor to the tug of war, though. Zeus ended up throwing a thunderbolt between them to show he did not approve of this fight. With the tripod restored, the oracle finally gave Heracles advice. It had a similar prescription to last time. Heracles was required to become a slave, and serve his new master for one or three years, depends on the version, and complete any tasks assigned during that time. Last time, Heracles ended up serving Eurysius. This time, Hermes sold him off to Omphale, the queen of Lydia in western Anatolia. Art from the late Hellenistic and Roman periods suggests this servitude was supposed to be embarrassing for Heracles. And what better way to embarrass the manly man hero than dressing him up in women's clothes and forcing him to help with the sewing? Roman mosaics even show Amphali watching over Heracles while he does these chores as she sits back, wearing his lion skin and lazily holding his club. It's a nice turn of events. Unfortunately, there are no existing sources from classical Greece that could provide any background to this. But while working for Amphali, there were also some other more classic Heracles adventures. Apollodorus records how Heracles captured the Kirkapes. These were a pair of troublesome thieves who plagued the land of Lydia. He punished them by tying them to a pole, which he then carried over his shoulder and with their heads hanging down. 
He let them go either when they told jokes and made him laugh, or when their mother asked him to. There are very few sources for this story, and most of them are late Hellenistic or later. But Herodotus does mention them in classical Greece, in the 5th century BC, and there is even a lost epic poem from the archaic 7th century BC, which gives details on the Kirkopes too. In Greek art, they appear trussed up on a pole over Heracles' shoulder as early as the 6th century BC. Some of these extra Heracles adventures and side quests were probably added in over time, but it seems the Kirkopi story was not a late addition to the Heracles myths. In another story, again recorded by Apollodorus and Diodorus, Heracles came up against Silius. He was a cruel man who owned a vineyard in Aulis. Instead of welcoming passing strangers, he would force them to dig ditches for him. Basically, he tricked them into becoming slaves. He tried to do the same to Heracles, and it went exactly how you might expect. Heracles killed Silius with the man's own hoe, his daughter Xenodyche in some versions, and then burned the entire vineyard to the ground. This story goes back to at least around 500 BC. There are vases which show Silius getting Heracles to cut down things with an axe. After Heracles finished his servitude to Omphali, he was free to return to Greece. Before he left, according to Diodorus, Ovid, and Apollodorus, he got Omphali pregnant with a son. Heracles also had another son with a slave girl at Omphali's palace. Now free, Heracles wanted to settle some old scores. Back to the life of violence he goes. He's really quite a blockhead. All this death, destruction, and atonement, and Heracles doesn't change in any way. So where did Heracles go next? First, a reminder. Heracles previously stopped off at Troy on his way back from getting the belt of Hippolyta. The Trojan king promised to give Heracles some horses if Heracles killed a sea monster terrorizing the city. Of course, the king later went back on his promise. In Apollodorus' library, after completing his labors, Heracles gathered an army and sailed for Troy with a fleet of 18 ships. One of his men was his friend Telamon, who it is said sometimes went with him to the Amazons as well. The heroes broke down the walls of Troy and advanced into the city, killing as they went, slaying all but one of the Trojan king's sons. Afterwards, Heracles gave the captured princess Hesene as a reward to Telamon, making her into some kind of concubine. Returning to mainland Greece, Heracles had a different score to settle in southern Greece. Again, he gathered a group of followers. This time, they marched into Elis to fight against Ogeus. Another quick reminder. Heracles last encountered Ogeus when he was tasked with cleaning out the king's cow manure-filled stables. That labor didn't count, because Heracles asked for some of Ogeus's cows as a reward. Ogeus tried to get away with not paying Heracles, by claiming he never promised anything, and then ran the hero out of town. Now Heracles had come to get his due. Only this time, instead of cows, he wanted the blood of Ogeus. After receiving word of the approaching army, Ogeus gathered his troops. He put the Elian army under the command of two generals, named Eurytus and Cetus. These two were twins, together called the Molionides. They were the sons of Ogeus' brother Actor and a woman named Molione. Like a lot of Greek heroes, they had a second divine father. In their case, this was Poseidon. Something else interesting about the Molionides is they're not your typical twins. They were actually conjoined. The Molionides fared better than a number of Heracles' other adversaries. Pindar, in the 5th century BC, is actually the earliest source to mention the twins, and his version is almost identical to Apollodorus. The Molionides attacked Heracles' army and killed many people, causing Heracles to retreat. But later, after participating in an athletic tournament, Heracles ambushed them on the road home and killed them. With the Molionides out of the way and their army without its leaders, Heracles was free to march into Elis and restart his war against Ogeus. To quote Pindar, Ogeus saw his homeland and all his wealth in the fell strokes of iron-handed war wasted beneath the breath of stubborn flame and his own city sunk in the pit of doom. Heracles killed Ogeus and most of his sons. As for Ogeus's daughters, 
they were likely captured as prisoners of war and given away to some of Heracles' followers as rewards for fighting alongside of him. This was a brutal, yet fairly typical outcome in early ancient Greek warfare. These women would serve as maids and domestic servants in the houses of their captors, kind of like Heracles when he served Omphale. Women like this would also sometimes become sex slaves. In this way, Ogius' daughter Epicast was said to have had a son with Heracles, a son that would have been the product of a rape. What happened to Elis afterwards? Many years previously, when Heracles was first in Elis, Ogius' son Phileas tried to stick up for the hero when his father tried to double-cross him. Phileas was exiled for it, but now Heracles brought him back and gave him the kingdom to rule. Next, Heracles planned on continuing his revenge spree. A moment ago, I talked about how Heracles served Queen Omphale for a few years. Like with his famous Twelve Labors, the intent behind serving Omphale was to gain forgiveness for a crime Heracles committed. In this case, it was because he threw a man, the son of a king, off Tyrion's city walls. Originally, Heracles went to two kings to try and get them to purify him for the murder, but they refused, and Heracles had held a grudge against them ever since. Like with the Olympian gods, if Heracles has a grudge against you, watch out, because disaster isn't too far away. The first king Heracles moved against was Nellius, king of Pylos, and it's going to go exactly as you might expect. Interestingly, we have a very old source for this, Homer's Iliad, but in this version, Heracles actually moves against Nellius before he got his revenge on Ogius. In the Iliad's version, Heracles brought his armies against the armies of Pylos and defeated them. Eleven of the twelve sons of Nellius were killed, except for the youngest one, named Nestor. Apollodorus's later version keeps these broad strokes. Heracles marched on Pylos and killed all of the sons of Nellius except for Nestor. But Apollodorus also provides some additional, very tantalizing details. He names Nellius' oldest and bravest son, a man named Periclymenus. This warrior was a shapeshifter, and he took advantage of this power during the battle. Apollodorus also says that the god Hades joined the fight, aligning with the city of Pylos, but Hades was wounded by Heracles during the fighting. I think this event has the makings of such a cool story, a battle with a shapeshifter, a duel with a god. I wish there was a longer, more detailed poem that gave more insight on this Heracles adventure. In the end, though, the result was similar to what happened with Ogius. Nellius and most of his sons, including Periclymenus, were killed. Heracles handed the kingdom over to the lone son that survived, Nestor. The next king on Heracles' list was Hippocoon, king of Sparta. Heracles had two problems with Hippocoon and his family. The first one was obvious. Hippocoon had refused to purify Heracles for murder. How dare he? The second reason was a little far removed. Remember in the first Heracles episode, before the hero was born, I talked about how his mother and father were exiled to Thebes? I also mentioned how they were accompanied by another relative named Lycimnius. Since then, Lycimnius had a son named Alanos, and probably about the same age as Heracles, as this young man was one of Heracles' retainers who joined him on these conquests. When Heracles and his army came to Sparta, Oanos acted as a scout. When he approached Hippocoon's palace, the family guard dog came out and chased him. Oanos killed the dog, but then was killed by Hippocoon's angry sons. Never mind the fact that he was part of an invading army, Heracles wanted revenge for his cousin's death. When the war began, there were heavy losses on both sides, but Heracles' army eventually killed Hippocoon and captured Sparta. In other conquests, Heracles replaced the dead enemy kings with a son Heracles didn't have a problem with. But with Hippocoon, all of his sons were dead. So who did Heracles set up as king? Years previously, Hippocoon took over the kingship from his brother Tyndarius. This man was still alive, and hadn't been doing anything to bother Heracles, so the hero brought him back to Sparta and entrusted the kingdom to him. And with that, Heracles' revenge bucket list was complete. Troy, Pylos, and now Sparta. What now? At this point, listeners might have some questions. 
The first one might be, okay, Heracles finished his labors and got purified for murdering his family. Then he got purified again for murdering someone else. Why doesn't he just retire? Why the new career in roving over-the-top bloodshed? Why doesn't he take himself, his fame, his ever-expanding harem, and go settle down in Thebes or somewhere else? Well, at some point after his labors, according to Diodorus, Heracles and his family did return to their ancestral home in Tiryns to live. But while there, Eurystheus, who was still the king, and probably feeling threatened by the presence of his very strong, very famous, very unstable relative, accused Heracles of plotting to seize the throne. Eurystheus banished Heracles and commanded him to take his family and leave the kingdom forever. Heracles, surprisingly, did so, and made his new home at a place called Phineas in Arcadia. When I found out about that, I wondered something else. Heracles lived in the middle of Arcadia, right? In southern Greece. He went to Elis, deposed Ogeus. He went to Pelos, deposed Nellius. He went to Sparta, got rid of Hippocoon. These are all major kingdoms in southern Greece. If Heracles started in Arcadia, his army successfully moved north, west, and then south. It's only Eurystheus' Argolid in the east that's left. But why does Heracles just move from one land to the other? Why doesn't he set himself up as an overlord? Why doesn't he accomplish what Pelops and Perseus could not? Add Eurystheus to the list of dead kings and establish a great big Herculean empire in southern Greece. As far as I can tell, this idea was never discussed or even entertained as a possibility by the ancient poets. And I think the reason why has something to do with fate. When Heracles' mother was pregnant, Zeus made a sloppy declaration that the next descendant of Perseus would become king of Mycenae. Hera promptly delayed Heracles' birth and messed the whole plan up when Eurystheus was born first. If Heracles had been born first, as far as the Greeks were concerned, he would have become king, and maybe would have gone on to rule all of southern Greece as a king. But Heracles wasn't born first so he lost the fate to be king before he even had it. And if he can't be king, he can't ever be king. Putting it another way, it all comes down to Hera. As queen of heaven, Hera is responsible for sovereignty. Like Zeus, she can theoretically raise up princes and knock down kings whenever she wants. But Hera doesn't like Heracles, so she's never going to raise him to that level even if he technically should be able to do it himself. Hera will just block him. Taking a more character-centric perspective, Heracles just isn't the king type. Sure, he can lead armies, slay monsters, and do seemingly impossible tasks, but he's also impulsive, unstable, entitled. Not exactly qualities that make good administrators or nation-builders. So for all his conquests, Heracles finds a replacement to clean up his mess, and then continues on. At the beginning of this episode, Heracles tried to find a new wife. And the first girl he tried to marry was Iole. Her father refused to give her to Heracles. He killed her brother, and then had to end her servitude for Umphali. The murder also led to Heracles' invasion of two different kingdoms. At this point, Heracles was still single. To change this, he next went to Caledon. This was another city-state, this time located in western Greece. This is a fairly mountainous region, and the pod hasn't spent a lot of time here so far. The gods Apollo and Artemis were especially important here. Caledon was ruled by a king named Oneus. He had a number of important children, but for now, I'll talk about his daughter, Dianera. Previously, when Heracles was in the underworld, he met the ghost of his dead friend, Meleager. This was Dianera's brother, and the spirit told Heracles about his still-living, beautiful younger sister. This is the woman Heracles goes to Caledon to try to marry. But when he got there, Heracles found he wasn't alone. Another person was interested in Dianera, and also arrived in Caledon. Someone very different from Heracles, a powerful river spirit, named Achilles. What follows is recorded by Apollodorus in the 2nd century AD, 
However, we know some version of this story is at least as old as the 6th century BC, thanks to artistic scenes on Greek vases and a lost epic poem about it written in the 7th century BC. The incident is also detailed in Sophocles' play The Trachinae, written around 440 BC. Heracles and Achilles wrestled, and to the winner would go the hand of Dianera, never mind what she thought about the whole thing. During the wrestling bout, Achilles made use of his shape-shifting powers, something many water-related Greek gods are able to do. Achilles' favored form was that of a bull. Sophocles provides a very poetic description of the match. There was a clatter of fists, the crash of a bull's horns mixed together, and then there were close-locked grapplings and deadly blows from foreheads and loud, deep cries from both combatants. Meanwhile, the delicate beauty sat on the side of a hill, awaiting the husband that would be hers. In the end, Heracles knocked one of the bull's horns right off. Heracles, the winner, married Dianera. Time passed, and Apollodorus says at some point Dianera's father held a feast. During the festivities, there was an accident of some kind, and Heracles killed a boy. The boy's father forgave Heracles, but Heracles still went into exile for the murder, taking Dianera with him. Dianera's story is also told in Sophocles' 430 BC play, The Trachinae. In that version, Heracles enters this exile after killing the son of Eurytos, the brother of Aeoli. This is the murder I mentioned at the beginning of the episode, the one that caused Heracles to go serve Omphali. So the two versions give two different exiles, but either way, Heracles is exiled from somewhere and leaves with Dianera. While they were traveling, the two came to a river, where a centaur named Nessus ferried over passengers one at a time. Heracles crossed the river himself, his strength allowing him to wade out into the river and not be swept away by the current. But he paid the centaur to carry his wife over, not wanting her to get wet. While Nessus had Dianera by herself, he attempted to rape her. From the boat, she cried out to her husband for help. Heracles heard and shot the centaur with an arrow. Nessus wasn't immediately killed. As he lay dying, Nessus told Dianera to gather up his blood. It would serve as a love potion, and Nessus told Dianera she could use it on Heracles if she thought he was ever straying from his love for her. Dianera followed Nessus's instructions, created the love potion, and later stored it in a bronze urn. After crossing the river, Heracles and Dianera made their way to the city of Trachis in central Greece. There is another myth where Heracles had a connection to its king, either because they were friends or because Heracles got rid of him like so many other kings. Even though he was now married, Heracles was still attracted to Aeoli, the daughter of Eurytos. Heracles couldn't get Aeoli out of his head. He also still harbored a grudge against her father for refusing to hand her over. And if there's two things Heracles acts on, they are acquiring new women and settling scores with people he thinks wronged him. So, while in Trachis, Heracles again assembles an army. This time, he plans to attack Aeoli's home of Ocalia and punish her father, Eurytos. These events are the focus of Sophocles' play, Trachinae. Heracles' army takes over Ocalia, Eurytos and his sons are killed, and Aeoli is taken captive. For Heracles, if he couldn't have Aeoli as a wife, sex slave was good enough for him. I never said Heracles was a good guy, did I? Because he is not. According to Sophocles and Apollodorus, to celebrate his success, Heracles wanted to make a big sacrifice to Zeus. To get the right items, he sent his messenger, Lycus, back to Trachis. Meanwhile, in Trachis, Dianera was worried. Marriage to Heracles had not proven all it's cracked up to be. It started with joy, but now Dianera's life was full of sorrow. Her hero husband was often out on his adventures, and didn't come home often. They did have a son, though a young man named Hylas. Dianera sent Hylas to go find his father. Soon after Hylas left, Heracles' messenger arrived. The messenger told Dianera what Heracles was up to while he was away, how he has now marched against King Eurytos. Lycus the messenger was also not alone. He brought back the captive women, including the young Aeoli. Another man told Dianera that one of the young captives was Aeoli, 
daughter of Eurytos, and that the whole point of Heracles' latest adventure was to capture her, and then sleep with her if he hadn't already. Dianera didn't want her husband Heracles to take Ioli as a lover. She decided to use the centaur Nessus's love potion, which she had kept all this time to make Heracles fall in love with her yet again. She took the love potion and rubbed it into some wool. She then used the wool to make a long robe. Dianera gave the love potion infused robe to Lycus the messenger. She told him to take it back to Heracles. She said she made it herself, and that it was a present for her husband, and she wanted Lycus to promise that he would take it to Heracles and make sure he was the first person to wear it. Lycus agreed. After Lycus was gone, Dianera began to fear her actions. Cleaning up, she placed some of the leftover love potion-soaked wool under sunlight. The wool quickly warmed up and then shriveled and turned to dust. She realized she was tricked. The centaur Nessus never meant to give her a love potion. He meant for her to collect some of his hydra poison blood and kill her own husband with it. At this point, her son Hylas returned. He brang bad news. Hylas found his father, and then Lycus arrived bearing Dianera's gift. Heracles wore it while he performed a great sacrifice to the gods. Upon putting it on, a sweat broke out across Heracles' body, and the tunic clung to him. And then came a biting pain that racked his bones, and the venom of the hydra began to devour him. Hylas cursed his mother for what she had done. She left and, consumed by shame, killed herself. Hylas later learned that she did not mean to hurt his father. In the end, a dying Heracles, consumed with agony, arrived. He ordered the young Hylas with marrying Ioli when he became old enough, and then Heracles went to the mountains, ordered a great big pyre constructed, took his place on the top, and commanded one of his followers to set it on fire. To end his suffering, Heracles was burned alive. According to Apollodorus, at the moment of his death, a great sound of thunder shook the surroundings, and Heracles ascended to heaven. Once he joined the gods on Mount Olympus, Heracles reconciled with Hera. He also gained another wife. This time, it was Hebe, the daughter of Zeus and Hera usually associated with youth. On Olympus, she previously served as a cupbearer for the gods. With Hebe, Heracles had two more sons. This time, two twin immortal sons. Not much is known about these two gods. They likely acted as gatekeepers on Mount Olympus and were possibly worshipped by the Greeks in some way. Heracles is a strange figure in Greek mythology in that he is both a god and a hero. He is the son of a god and a mortal woman. He starts off mortal, becomes an immortal, and lives on Mount Olympus afterwards. In this way, he is very similar to the god Dionysus. And as a god, like Dionysus and the rest, Heracles was worshipped by the ancient Greeks. His main cult was at Thebes, which makes sense since the myths have it as his place of birth. But Heracles also had shrines scattered throughout Greece, and people everywhere celebrated his festivals. Some places where he was especially important were gymnasiums and athletic competitions, especially when they were for wrestling. Outside of Greece, Heracles' cult spread to the Greek colonies in Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, and to Italy. In Lydia, he was a protector from plagues and agricultural pests. In Rome, Heracles' adventures, especially when he went west to find the cattle of Geryon, were incorporated into stories related to the founding of Rome. Heracles' cult even extended beyond the Mediterranean Sea. It was carried deeper into Asia by the Greek armies of Alexander the Great. Heracles was even incorporated into Buddhism. Art depicting the Buddhist figure Vajrapani took on a very Heracles-esque appearance, as a mostly naked man with a beard, holding a massive club. Over the last four episodes, listeners may have been a little overwhelmed by the sheer number of Heracles' adventures. I know I was a little when I was making these episodes. There's the stories of his youth, the core twelve labors, and then there's all the other events, sometimes occurring in between labors, some occurring after the labors are complete, and others that we don't really know where to put them. There's some other ones that I didn't even include. A lot of these adventures seem to only be detailed in the later literary sources. 
but we know the stories existed centuries earlier because of similar scenes shown on Greek vases from the Archaic and Classical periods. And then there's the references in Classical Greek plays. But we can't forget that Heracles was a very larger-than-life hero, a very popular hero, and it's very likely that some of the adventures were added into the hero's tradition over time. People from different places in Greece probably would have tried to tie him to their own community by having him fight a bandit nearby. It's also entirely possible that the Heracles tradition was allowed to absorb myths from other heroes, especially very local heroes that we may not know a lot about today. Some of Heracles' lesser-known minor adventures show striking similarities to myths told about other lesser-known heroes, or almost seem like copies of his own other adventures. For example, there's the story of Pyricomes. He was a cruel king that Heracles tied to his own prized horses. The horses tore him apart. This myth is only recorded in one place, by a Greek historian in the 2nd century AD. But it does sound similar to what Heracles did to Diomedes in one of his labors. The Diomedes story is more widely sourced and is likely the older story. Could the Pyricomes one be a late addition to the Heracles tradition? Possibly just a localized copy of the Diomedes one? Another example is the slaying of the Catharian lion, which is typically linked to Heracles. In some versions, it's the corpse of this lion, not the Nemean lion, that Heracles uses to make his lion skin clothes. But the same lion is also linked by Pisanias, with another hero named Alcathus. Is one of these stories a copy of the other? What if the Alcathus one was the original, and a version arose with Heracles replacing him? What if the Heracles slaying the Catharian lion story is just a local copy of the Nemean lion story? If these guesses are true, it's possible these stories were attempts to bring the fame of Heracles into a remote community. Oh, Heracles. He came here not too long ago. He killed a monster. He kidnapped my daughter. He threw my cabin in the river. He stayed over at my parents and my mom made him her famous sandwiches. It's kind of like the odd bar or bed and breakfast in some small towns that claim some famous celebrity stopped by one day many years ago. At the same time, we may have several examples of Heracles stories that developed as Heracles stories within a specific community that just really liked him. Some very interesting examples involve Heracles' myths out of Italy. I've talked before about how the Romans adopted large parts of Greek mythology, and how some things changed in the New Roman world. It's part of the reason why I like to point out if some literary sources come from the later Roman period. But the Romans were not just influenced by the Greeks. They were also influenced by earlier people living in Italy. One of these major indigenous influences were a people called the Etruscans. They had their own religion, gods, and myths that we don't know a huge amount about today. But even the Etruscans were influenced by the Greeks before the Romans were even on the scene. As early as the 6th century BC, there are examples of Etruscan art that might show scenes from Greek myth, but with some key differences. It's debatable. But eventually, art with clear characters from Greek myth developed. In some cases, they're even labeled. For this episode, I want to end with two of those examples, because they show very strange elements that might change how you think about Heracles. The first is a bronze mirror decorated with a scene showing a full-grown adult Heracles, called Hercule. By the Etruscans. In the scene, this Heracles sucks the breast of the goddess Uni, the equivalent of the Roman Juno and Greek Hera. The surviving but broken caption indicates the scene might tell how Hercule was adopted by the goddess. This scene is so weird. Why is Hera suckling Heracles? She's practically the hero's sworn enemy. Is there anything like this in the Greek and Roman myths? There is. Kind of. There is one story that when Heracles was a baby, Zeus or Athena got Hera to breastfeed him while she was either asleep or without knowing it was Heracles. The drinking of Hera's milk allowed Heracles to be eligible to receive divine honors later. This matches a little with the Etruscan image showing how Hercule was adopted. But in the scene, Hercule isn't a baby. He's grown up. What we have here 
is a Heracles myth that doesn't appear anywhere else, at least in the existing sources. Is it a purely Etruscan version? Did it maybe develop into the suckling as a baby story? Does it answer a question about why Heracles had a name meaning Hera's glory, even though Hera in all the myths seems to hate his guts? Does the fact it feature an adult Heracles mean this was supposed to have happened after Heracles completed his labors, or after he died? I have so many questions about this Etruscan scene. It drives me crazy. I'll put an image of the Etruscan art on the podcast website, so you can take a look and puzzle over it yourself. There's one more Etruscan scene that might weird you out. In part two of the Heracles episode, I mentioned that Heracles' labors are depicted in sculpture at the Temple of Zeus at Olympia. In this collection, Heracles starts as a youth and progresses to being a rugged adult by the last image. In the background, he has Athena watching over him, and she also progresses from young girl to older woman. In the Heracles myths recorded in literature, Athena also watches over Heracles. That may have not been obvious in my retellings of the myths, but in some versions, she directly intervenes by giving Heracles helpful hints. What does this have to do with the Etruscans? Well, in a couple examples of Etruscan art, say from around the 300s BC, Athena isn't just looking out for Heracles. In a couple scenes, they are shown much more intimately, with their arms around each other. This could suggest the Etruscans viewed their Athena equivalent, named Minerva, and their Hercules as a romantic couple. This is obviously very strange. Again, this appears to be a uniquely Etruscan tradition for Heracles, but I wanted to share it now as I think it might make people view Heracles, and possibly also Athena, in a different light, and show that there were sometimes very unique interpretations of these mythic figures even during their heydays in ancient times. And that brings me to the end of my four episodes covering the myths of Heracles, who is hands down the most famous of all the Greek heroes today. If you enjoyed these episodes, send them to a friend, and write the pod a review on your podcast streamer of choice. As always, thank you for listening.